Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Langdon White. Um, and uh, just in case you're in the wrong place, this is a talk about software collections. Uh, and they're kind of cool. And hopefully, I will convince you they are cool. Uh, or you will uh, already be using them and already know they're cool. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, if you've seen my other, some of my other talks, uh, you might be getting tired of this uh, pitch, but I apologize in advance. I don't have a whole lot of jokes, uh, so this is the, the limit I've got. Um, so I actually joined Red Hat as a developer advocate, developer evangelist for Enterprise Linux. Um, and uh, so that meant I had to kind of represent every language on Enterprise Linux, which is not trivial, as you might imagine. Uh, and uh, but my running joke is I've done production applications in basically every major language uh, with the exception of Python. Uh, so now I pretty much exclusively program in Python just to frustrate myself as much as possible. Um, now uh, I actually moved from uh, that group into engineering uh, a couple of years ago. And so uh, as the architect for the developer experience team. Um, and, uh, but mostly lately I've been working on Fedora modularity which is an upstream project um, to kind of do actually similar things or to solve similar problems that software collections solve. So I'll talk about what it does, and, um, and, but if you go check out the Fedora modularity project, um, you might see where uh, like Fedora wants to go regarding this problem uh, and, and maybe more, uh, more interesting solutions, more expansive solutions um, than, uh, than just software collections. So uh, the other picture, uh, the other half of the picture is my son Thomas. Uh, he plays a lot of soccer, um, and my usual joke here, if I do this in Europe, is you know football. Um, he plays a lot of basketball, and he does lots of homework. He goes to Boston Latin School, which is a very difficult school. Um, and weirdly enough, uh, he uses Instagram to talk to his friends. Uh, so I guess what they, the cool kids do is they actually post a picture on Instagram. And then they comment back and forth to communicate, uh, except it doesn't have anything actually to do with the picture. It's really just a placeholder so that they can talk to each other without uh, actually um, being able to be tracked by their parents. So I'm not sure what that says about my son that he told me this, but you know. Um, however, when I was prepping for this talk and I told him that I was going to make this, you know, comment or whatever, uh, he said that. Um, you know, that was so last week, and in fact, they're all about Snapchat now, uh, which I try to use and look at and stuff, but I just, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't really get it. So I don't know if I'm old, um, but oh my god, the UI. Uh, so, so that's a bit about me, um, and uh, why are we here? Okay, so that's cool. Um, It's like something about that slide. Oh, all the slides. Huh. Uh, yeah, that's not good. Let's see if I can do it. Let's see if we do this. Still wants to do it. Wow. Uh, hmm. Oh, this is just going to be a good day. Uh, all right. Hopefully, that's not too terrible. Um, can you guys at least still see that? I hope. Um, all right. So, uh, God, that's going to drive me crazy. Um, so, okay. Okay. Uh, nope. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, okay, so basically, you have this uh, this kind of balancing act, right, between the developers and uh, you know, kind of system engineers or sysadmins or uh, whatever. Um, you know, you kind of have the developers always want to use kind of the latest bleeding edge code. Um, this was even worse, I would say, uh, you know, five or ten years ago because of the life or the length of time it took you to develop an application. You wanted to use the most bleeding edge, maybe even beta code. 
uh, or sorry, kind of platforms and languages and that kind of stuff because by the time you were done with the application, it would be stable and kind of out there in production or you can make a pretty good bet it would. Um, and if you use something stable at the start, then it would be old and outdated by the time your application was done. Um, so that's gotten less true, right? Applications are developed much more quickly now, um, but it's still, uh, you know, developers still desire to use the, the kind of as close to bleeding edge as they can get because it has new features and, and all that stuff that they really want for their applications. Um, and it makes their, their development time shorter and simpler uh, if they can use a lot of that new feature set. Also, you know, performance, whatever, lots of different reasons. Whereas kind of the other side of the house, um, the sysadmins, they want stability, right? They want support. You know, there's, you know, like almost seriously, right? A million lines of code often between what your developer actually wrote and you know, kind of the hardware, right? Uh, so sysadmins need support uh, to be able to uh, actually properly uh, bring something into production and, and make sure it stays upright. So you have this, this balancing act, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and so kind of moving on from that, like, there's, in a related way, you have this kind of life cycle independence problem where, um, you know, kind of an operating system has a particular life cycle. Often people look at operating systems and they say to themselves, actually, they have a, a really long life cycle. But that's only kind of true, right? It has a really long life cycle for any given hardware, right? But you actually want a kind of a new version of your OS anytime you want to light up new hardware. And so you have to do changes for things like Skylake, right? Um, so, so it kind of needs to be both fast moving and slow moving kind of at the same time. And then you have frameworks, right? So something like Drupal or like Flask or, you know, kind of uh, these technology frameworks that you're going to build your applications on top of um, that has its own life cycle uh, that's kind of separate and distinct from the operating system. And then, of course, you have the applications themselves, which then in turn have their own life cycle. My uh, typical example around this, right, is like you take like a movie website, right? You know, mostly static content, uh, wants to be built super fast, uh, you know, but it's only going to last three months, maybe a year at the outside. Uh, so you can use the bleeding edge technology. You can use, um, it, it doesn't have to be, quote unquote, that stable, right? You're not worried about losing transactions because it's only a read-only site. Um, you know, versus, uh, you know, something like uh, one of the systems I built was a kind of approval software. So where managers, uh, you know, often have to go into, especially in big enterprises, have to go into like 20 different applications to approve expense reports or approve promotions or approve whatever. So we wrote a system that actually aggregated all those approvals. But it doesn't change that much, right? And it has to be perfect because you don't want to have to send that manager back to do it again. Um, so, you know, on that kind of software, you want to choose a different set of frameworks or a different set of uh, components so that you have long-term stability. Um, and so you have all these different life cycles at play, which makes things difficult. Um, so this slide is here to talk about pace layers, which is kind of another way of talking about that life cycle problem. Uh, but I don't use enough cats in my talks, uh, is what I've been told. Uh, so at a conversation at dinner last night, uh, I was told that a civet cat apparently is the slowest cat. So the civet cat represents systems of record. Okay, so this is what Gartner calls these pace layers. Systems of record are like your ERPs, right? So your Oracle apps, um, you know, the things you spend multiple millions of dollars installing setting up, configuring, you sometimes change your business to match their workflows. A, a very expensive operation for setup and run. Um, but then you basically want to just leave it alone, right, for, for as long as humanly possible uh, because it's so expensive to rebuild it. So Gartner refers to those as systems of record. Then, according to Google, tigers are kind of in the middle as far as speed is concerned. Um, and that's what we call, actually, let me talk about systems of innovation next. So, Cheetah, everybody knows Cheetah, super fast. Um, this is what you call systems of innovation. And these are, um, you know, applications that are going to run for three months or a year. Really, you're putting them out there so that your customers can kind of give you feedback on whether this application is useful, right? Or whether it's actually meeting the needs that were kind of originally given for this particular application. Um, so, Gartner calls those systems of innovation, uh, very fast changing, um, uh, you know, usually using very bleeding edge software uh, because it does have a short life cycle. Um, 
And then kind of the last one, and the reason I kind of switched it around, is the systems of differentiation, the Tiger. Um, and these are applications that are how you differentiate yourself from your competitors. So the systems of innovation are you trying to figure out how to differentiate yourself, right? And then you kind of flip those into the, this kind of other mode once you're comfortable and your customers uh, you know, kind of have given you feedback that tells you this is a good application for this team or for their customers. Um, and really that's what software collections are trying to target is this kind of systems of differentiation uh, scenario. So software collections. Um, so basically, what do software collections do? They're trying to like give you some independence from the operating system, uh, you know, kind of, or sorry, really the distro uh, and the lifecycle of the pieces of the distro, so that there's um, you know kind of a separation between those two things. And there are lots and lots of tools that do parts of this er, solution, right? So kind of on the left hand, you kind of have package managers of various kinds. You have you know kind of distro level package managers like Yum, um, but then you actually have application or sorry language package managers like NPM or um, I wonder some of the others PIP, uh, Gem, you know lots of the others. Um, and then kind of on the right hand side of this slide, you also have different ways of uh, kind of making the application independent from the distro distributed components, right? So like in Python, you might use virtual env. Um, you know, there is another thing called environment modules, which is more generic. Um, you've probably all used, at least at some point, used alternatives, um, which, you know, is, is another way of doing it. They all have, uh, basically, all of this have good and bad things about them. Uh, like kind of on the package manager side, when you talk about language package managers, um, it's really hard if you're polyglot. So as a developer, it's hard to keep track of how to use pip versus using gem. Um, so that's one problem. As a sysadmin, it's even worse, right? Because you have applications coming in in all these different languages. And so you have to know all these different package managers. And then kind of the same, you have kind of the same problem with the language level kind of distro independence. Um, is you have to know the differences between RVM and virtual env and which one is the right answer. Um, and then something like alternatives uh, is challenging because that does it machine-wide, right? When uh, what software collections are meant to do is really do it uh, per application uh, so that you can have this application is using Python 3.5 and that application is using Python 2.7. And you want to run them on the same machine. Uh, so the alternatives infrastructure doesn't really work well for that. So, software collections. Um, so what software collections do is they kind of repackage RPMs in a kind of a different way such that uh, they kind of get installed kind of off to the side. Um, and I have another diagram on the next page that shows a little more detail about that. But as you can kind of read for yourself here, but basically the idea is, you know, can we ship these binaries in a way that is still managed by the normal package manager, so yum, although I will often type DNF by accident now because I use Fedora a lot now. Um, but, uh, you know, so yum still manages them. It manages its life cycle, updates work uh, the way you're used to with the package distro, uh, or with the package manager for the distro. Um, and, the big thing is it, it does no harm, right? So it doesn't overwrite anything based on the, the traditional system, right, that's actually based in the normal distro. Um, and then you can actually have software collections that uh, depend on other software collections. Uh, and so, you know, much like you can with RPM, right, because it really is just RPM underneath, um, you can actually have structured software collections. Uh, that can be a, a, a rat hole that can be dangerous to get into, and it's funny because I think with the Red Hat software collections, we've actually made some mistakes on this. So you want to be careful because you're looking for application independence, right? You're looking for component independence that if you, uh, what we usually refer to in RPM packaging is unbundle too much, uh, and so you now you have, um, I think the example that we were going down was um, we had two different things that both used the Google V8 JavaScript engine. And then, of course, one of them decided it wanted a more recent version of V8, and the other one didn't, right? And so V8 was its own software collection, so we started to have some trouble there. Um, so you gotta be really careful about where you do dependency uh, management, and in fact, because inside, inside a software collection, it's still all unbundled, right? It's still all individual RPMs. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, 
I guess you can't see that here as well as I thought you could, but um, because it's still all unbundled, you still have all that independence of updating, right? So, you know, if there's a patch to, um, you know, libssl or something, um, then you still get just that patch, right? Even in the software collection scenario, you don't have to update all of the software in the software collection. So the fact that you've decided that V8 will just be included in the Node.js software collection is fine because the unbundling is just kind of happening at a different level, right? Um, so the way the packaging works, um, like I said, it's basically just an RPM, except that it uses some macros to say, instead of installing in your normal place, install over here in opt. Um, what I think is one of the really nice things about um, the way the macros work is that you can use the same RPM spec file for a software collection, and then if, depending on kind of the flags you send when you build the RPM, it can build to the normal system as well. So it doesn't, it kind of doesn't hurt you to have only one spec file and keep it, use the Ruby term, right, to keep it dry, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and so the other thing that I think is sometimes not obvious, especially when I show graphics like this, right, is that you don't actually have to have Ruby installed at all right, in the main distro. You can install just the software collection. So um, the way you invoke the software collection is you say SCL enable, name of the collection, and then whatever the application is. So I usually just use bash as an example, but so you can just say bash, and then inside there, you now have a Ruby that's available uh, that isn't available on the rest of the distro, or the rest of the kind of instance, right, the rest of the VM. All right, so software collections, the distribution, you know, I keep talking about RPMs, um, but you actually also have uh, kind of other, like one major other channel to get the software collections, which is they are built out as Docker containers as well. Um, and then those Docker containers are actually then in turn used by OpenShift V3, uh, or not all of them, but some of them. So I kind of threw a graphic in here, which is probably really, really small for you. Um, but it's, it's, this is the Red Hat uh, Docker registry, which is at registry.access.redhat.com. Um, and you can search in there, and I just did a little search for Ruby, I think. Um, and you can see that there's uh, um, containers there of just the software collection itself. There's a container there of the kind of OpenShift version, which is what the S2I indicates. Um, and so for both, uh, um, sorry, OpenShift v3, which uses Docker containers, they're using the software collections in the Docker containers and then making that available as part of the platform as a service component. But actually in OpenShift v2, it also uses the software collections. Um, it's just not in, in Docker containers, it's in kind of actually another way of doing very similar thing to containers. Um, but what's super nice about that is that means that you as a developer or you as a sysadmin, um, if you have the software collection that is Ruby 2.3, that's the exact same binary, right, that you see land in OpenShift v2, OpenShift v3, in a Docker container, or on native RHEL. So as a result, uh, you don't have to, you know, theoretically, you don't have to kind of retest, you don't have to rebuild. It's all the same exact code underneath um, uh, because it's being shipped by platform and in, it just kind of redistributed in these other ways. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention, anybody has any questions or whatever, feel free to, uh, you know, kind of raise your hand and let me know. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, all right, so kind of moving on to what do we have uh, in this particular round of the software collections. <clears throat> so um, uh, the software collections uh, as a technology, we actually ship three different products, for lack of a better term. Um, that happen to use software collections. So one is Red Hat Software Collections, which is the kind of obvious one, um, which is a bit of a grab bag of different things. Um, and like I said before, it's kind of targeted at the systems of differentiation. Uh, it's a little bit of an eclectic mix uh, of what's in there, but it's things like languages and databases and that kind of stuff. Um, and generally speaking, the things that we put in here are things that don't really support parallel installation well. Um, and uh, Nick is in the room and is giving me a hard time about Python, which does. Um, but when we started this, it didn't do it as well as it does today. Um, another reason we'll choose it is because Upstream has a really aggressive update schedule. Uh, so Node.js is a great example of this. We don't really wanna, nobody wants to use a Node.js that we would ship in RHEL, 
right? You know, the 10 year life cycle on Node.js doesn't make a whole lot of sense yet for Node. Uh, it's actually starting to because they're, they're starting to do like an LTS release and that kind of stuff. But um, you know, when we first introduced Node.js, nobody wanted a 10 year life cycle on, on the version of Node.js that was out. They wanted to track kind of latest version. Um, the big one uh, is customer demand. And I mentioned this to some people before the talk started. You know, the only way we know what software collections you guys want to see is if you tell us. Um, and that, that plays a big role into how we decide which things that we choose to, to rebuild as software collections. Um, Unfortunately, the, with software collections, it's not, you know, it's not zero work, right? We have to uh, kind of redo the spec files. We have to maintain now at least two different versions most of the time. You know, Node.js is kind of an exception, right? But with like Python, for example, we have to maintain a version that's in the OS itself, right? And then we have to maintain the software collection version. Um, and then it's the other reason that something is in uh, Red Hat software collections, at least originally, we found actually when we released it that this became less true. Uh, but the idea was that these were things that you had to run both in development and in production, right? So Python, you need the version of Python in development and you need that same version in production, unlike something like uh, GCC, where you need the version in, in development but you don't need it in production, right? Because you compile it down and, and you don't need it anymore. Um, what we found actually was that uh, users actually wanted things like GCC um, actually on the production environment as well for on you know real time compilation that kind of stuff. Um, so so some of the rules have gotten a little a little messy. Is that a question? So okay, so the question is, do they do they look the same? You mean or? Right, so, right, right. So, okay, so the question was basically like, if I have a software collection that is shipping on RHEL 6, and I write an application on it, and then I use the same software collection on RHEL 7, uh, can I run the same application over there, right? Um, so, mostly, like, for, it, let's put it this way, um, we believe it is exactly the same. Like, we're trying to make it exactly the same. It is not binary for binary, uh, the same though. So theoretically there is a risk of it being different, um, but in practice I'd be pretty surprised if you came across an issue like that. But the idea of it is that to help, one of the, one of the goals, right, with software collections is to allow for uh, easier migration across versions of the distro. Um, so that, you know, if you do the Ruby 2, I don't know this actually exists, but I'm making it up. So, you know, the Ruby 2.3 on RHEL 6, um, and you run the same Ruby 2.3 on RHEL 7, an application should just move. So kind of what's in Red Hat Software Collections? This is so, uh, we recently launched 2.2, um, and my, my cool key here, I actually tried to do this with colors and stuff, and then they didn't show up, and now uh, they actually showed up like this, but didn't show up in projection mode, so I don't know, it was weird. Um, but so for Node.js, um, Node.js, like I mentioned, is doing an LTS release now, and they're four, I think it's the, I think it's the four series at large, like four is the X, uh, is the LTS, um, but it could be four, four, I can't remember. Um, but so that's the, uh, the kind of one of the newer versions of Node. Um, you know, Node is still progressing very, very quickly, um, but this was their LTS release, so we shipped that as a Node.js release. Um, and I think their LTS is three years or something. I mean, it's still much shorter than RHEL. Um, and then Perl was not really updated. Perl 5.2 excuse me, is available. Uh, PHP, again, kind of not really, no new version really available for, for PHP. Um, you know, a lot of the reasons we put things in, and if you notice, this is a minor release, right? So this is Red Hat Software Collections 2.2, .2, um, but we still introduce new collections. What we don't do in a, in a minor release is kill a collection, right? Um, so we introduce new things so that you can take advantage of new things as soon as they're available. And so what we try to do is kind of, as much as we can, we try to match the life cycle of the upstream. Um, and so we kind of ship it as soon as we can. Uh, and then, but then kind of the reverse of that, we don't take it out of uh, being able to be used until, uh, 
uh, you know, kind of the more major versions or whatever. Um, sorry, uh, it's the voices. Um, all right, and then uh, for Python, we're actually shipping uh, 3.5 now, and then we updated 2.7. Um, you know, basically we have people on both sides of, of that, you know, 3.0 boundary. Uh, Ruby is shipping a new 2.3. Um, uh, and then Rails, uh, so ROR is Ruby on Rails. Um, it's actually distributed as a separate package, um, and, and it allows you to combine kind of, I think it's any Ruby on Rails software collection with any Ruby software collection. Um, so you can kind of mix and match because they're not all the same. Um, so that makes it a little easier. So the latest Rails, I think it's the latest, is 4.2. Um, and then Maria 10.1, uh, the, 10 the 10 series of Maria is where they're starting to fork from MySQL. Uh, so I think it's still fully backwards compatible, um, but uh, they're starting to do completely new stuff from MySQL. And so that's the 10 series. Um, and then MongoDB, there's actually two new versions in there. Um, the 3.0, though, is actually, um, oh, you know what? I forgot I have highlights. Yeah. Um, so let me kind of run through these. I forgot I put in a highlight slide that you could actually read, which would be a little easier. Um, but so Mongo, uh, and then uh, there's a new Postgres as well. Um, and then kind of, like I said, it's a little bit eclectic. There's a, a bit of a grab bag in here, and we have, um, so Apache, uh, Nginx, Passenger. Passenger is a, like a, a way of running Ruby with a uh, web server. Um, and then Varnish the Cache, Dev Assistant, uh, Git, Maven, Thermostat, uh, V8, and uh, the common Java. So there's a, a bunch of packages, uh, Java packages that want to be revved on a pretty regular basis, mostly for things like Maven. Um, and so it's kind of a, a, a set of Java packages that are also managed as a software collection. Um, so yeah, so what I want to mention about Mongo. So Mongo, the 3.0 that's in there is not really meant, I would say, for kind of production use. It's really meant as a bridge uh, to get you to the 3.2. Um, so that's really the major use case there. Um, but so here's some of the highlights of kind of what the versions are um, and kind of why they're in there. Um, so there's, the, the one I, I think is cool is the uh, grep minus V uh, available in Ruby collections now. Um, and uh, let's see, what else do I wanna mention? Oh, and Maria has multi-master replication now, which is kind of cool. Um, so you guys can also read this later. Um, all right, so Postgres 9.5, uh, more uh, group by analysis features. Um, you know, so a bunch of stuff there, probably worth looking into if, if you uh, use Postgres. Uh, row level security, which is nice too. Um, and then uh, kind of performance improvements, particular around multi-CPU uh, environments. Um, and uh, let's see, what else was the other one? Uh, oh, Maven 3.3, uh, interesting. Now you can kind of split um, kind of the JDK you're using for Maven versus the JDK you're using to build better. Like it's, it's cleaner um, if you're using that stuff. Uh, and that's about it. All right, so like I said earlier, there's kind of three different sets of collections. The next one is dev tool set. So recently launched 4.1. And uh, so developer toolset, kind of like I said, the original idea was the stuff that you would only use on a developer's desktop, in a sense. Um, so GCC, uh, GDB, uh, lots of performance tools, uh, Eclipse, uh, Git, things like that. Um, but like I said, some of that stuff shifted around because uh, people are using it differently than we expected them to. Um, so. And if you notice, there are, you know, kind of version differences for kind of to your earlier point, right, uh, between RHEL 5, RHEL 6, and RHEL 7 uh, of what's available. Um, you know, we're trying to, you know, some of it is kind of customer demand, um, but, you know, it's like some things make sense on RHEL 7 and some things don't, right? Um, so one of the things that I like to point out with how the GCC stuff works is, um, in order to be kind of independent when you want to build uh, something with the DTS GCC, um, what it does is it statically links uh, more often, basically, when you're trying to use what an older version of RHEL, right? So, um, so that basically the the things that you want to build against uh, will be available even though they're not available in native RHEL. 
So instead of using as much dynamic linking um, where the dynamic wouldn't be there, uh, that's, that's kind of how it gets by uh, the problem of being multi-platform uh, targeted. Um, there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff going on with ZTS. Um, I don't know if there's a talk at the conference about it this year, um, but there's uh, also a bunch of work going on using Eclipse um, and Docker to let you kind of build from Eclipse into multiple targeted versions of RHEL inside containers um, and using cool things like libabigail um, around that as well. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, in dev toolset. Um, like I said, leveraging containers and leveraging multi-architect, or like not multi-architecture, but multi, uh, multi-version um, uh, builds, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so dev tool set, uh, one of the big things with dev tool set is kind of again, because of the nature of the beast, right? Um, we, don't, we don't do uh, updates and new versions as much. We do rebasing more because again, like, um, like GCC, right? You don't, you don't really need to keep using the 5.2 as often, right? You really can just upgrade. Um, so that's why they do uh, more rebasing in that tool chain. Um, you know, I think they, they try very hard not to, to hurt anybody, um, but uh, the, the kind of conceptually it's, it works slightly differently. Um, so kind of, I think I have a, oh, all right, so let me talk about, so the, the big highlight here um, is uh, basically, it, like Skylake support uh, in GCC, which kind of then cascaded into needing updates for a lot of the other stuff. Um, so that's really the big uh, thing that's going on there. Um, you know, it's GCC, right? So there's, there's invariably also a bunch of performance improvements and all those kinds of things as well. But uh, that, that was the big feature, uh, was, was kind of better Skylake support. Um, then we also just introduced, um, if you were at the keynote yesterday, we introduced the .NET software collection. Um, this, is a, this is a very lonely slide. Um, so I, I expect that to get longer uh, as more stuff comes out. Um, but uh, the, what, kind of the point I wanted to make here was that .NET is also shipped as a software collection. It's also shipped in a Docker container like the other software collections. However, it is not part of Red Hat software collections. It's its own like I said, product, for lack of a better term. Uh, so you don't find it in the same channel as the Red Hat software collections. Um, so you kind of have to go and find the .NET one um, so if you wanted to use that stuff. And that's how you can get you know, C Sharp and .NET Core and all that jazz. Um, is there anything else? I think that was all I wanted to say about .NET. Would it, anything else about .NET? Anybody have any questions about it? Um, OK. Sorry? Oh, is there? Okay, so there's another .NET talk, or there's a talk about using .NET on RHEL uh, this afternoon uh, in this room, in fact. Um, so definitely, you know, come to that if you're interested. Um, so the last thing I uh, just kind of wanted to tell you a little bit was installation directions, right? So uh, how do you get it? So generally, m a, like most of the subscriptions uh, kind of have these included already. Uh, you know, there is some variability like uh, whatever it's called now, desktop or something, I think doesn't have uh, some of these. Um, but for the most part, it's there. You just kind of have to go and look at your kind of list of subscriptions. Um, and yeah, so I will show you kind of a little bit of a demo. Um, I think a lot of people in the room actually, Frank, if I can find where the window goes. Um, so you kind of just, uh, enable the particular uh, repo, um, and uh, you know this is documented on. There was oh sorry, I meant to show you the. Let's see if I can do this right. All right, so if you see, there's a Bitly link all the way on the right, right there. That's kind of where how you go find all the different collections. Um, but it's just Bitly slash uh, RHSCL. Um, but. So once you know which uh, kind of, you know, which channel you want to get them from, you just kind of enable it. Um, and then, let's see. Let's see. what. Um, just blanked. Uh, three, five. Um, the other thing is, generally speaking, they have an RH in front of them. Um, 
And uh, OK, so one of the things about the software collections, so uh, there's softwarecollections.org. So this is all open source, all upstream, you know, typical for us. Um, so softwarecollections.org has um, one, one I particularly like is Vagrant. So you can actually get Vagrant for RHEL. Um, but it comes from, so it's kind of softwarecollections.org is kind of, uh, you know, to RHEL RPMs as Apple is to RHEL RPMs. Um, so if you go there, uh, you can find um, kind of other, oops. And you can kind of find um, other collections that we, so either pre-release, right, so that's where we, we try to do a lot of our work is actually up, you know, kind of in the community. Um, and so you can kind of find software collections that we haven't released yet. There's also collections there that we are not planning to release, um, but that other people are maintaining, or even there are some there that Red Hat employees are maintaining, but they're doing it in their spare time. Um, so one of them, like I was talking about, is Vagrant. Um, and actually, just to plug the, the container development kit, this, this is actually a Vagrant VM running the container development kit Sorry, this is Vagrant running the Container Development Kit VM, uh, which registers as RHEL and gives you access to all this stuff uh, using the $0 developer subscription. Um, so you can actually go and use software collections right through the Container Development Kit if you so desire. Um, but so all I do is kind of install it once I find it. Oh, and I, sorry, I got distracted. Um, the RH dash indicates that this particular version of the Python 3.5 collection is the one that we defined as the right things to put in that software collection. So if you recall, I said um, that it's important to think about what you want to put in that software collection from a dependency perspective, because if you don't include enough, you uh, run into some problems, right? Later on when you start to have, basically you get back to regular old RPMs because now your dependency management is screwball, right? Um, so we introduced the RH dash to indicate this is what we believe uh, belongs in the Python 3.5 collection. However, some other organization would put their uh, Lana, you know, the Linux naming thing, um, their name at the beginning and say, you know what, this is what we believe is in the Python collection. So that even upstream, you can say, okay, this collection is the same one uh, that Red Hat believes, you know, is what belongs in it. So for example, the Vagrant collection is actually um, the SCLO collection. So the software collections guys who are running that thing decided, you know what, this is what we think goes in the Vagrant collection. So it'll be SCLO dash Vagrant one. And then customarily, it's also uh, the version number is kind of on the end. Um, so, and then just to kind of, you know, prove the point, right? Uh, we do, blink, right? And then we say, SCL enable Python 3.5. And <laughs> of course, uh, I'm gonna pretend that didn't happen. Um, but now I would write Python dash dash version and it would work magically. And I don't know what I did wrong, but I'm sure it was something stupid. Oh, duh. There we go, all right. Um, and so now we're on Python 3.5. And like, it's, it's super cool and does not demo well. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, question. So this is a common complaint. So uh, the, the complaint is um, how, I'm gonna paraphrase, but you know, tell me if I'm completely wrong, but um, what if I want to drop into the shell and Python 3.5 is always enabled? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, um, the one solution to that is essentially modify bash RC so that uh, it actually executes the enable script on login. Uh, if you're not using bash, is your point, that can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, 
and so we don't have a great solution for that right now. Um, there's, uh, it, is, it is definitely a common complaint. Um, so it's, but it doesn't have a good answer is basically the problem. Uh, and I would say that um, some of the efforts we're doing uh, kind of you know, in the community, in Fedora, whatever, is to try to address some of those issues, is how can we make um, this kind of life cycle independence um, more complete Right. Right. So, so uh, for the camera, you know, audience member says he's actually written a script that that solves some of this problem, and I'm saying back developer blog uh, takes external submissions. So we would love a blog post about that. Um, you know, to definitely let us know. You know, if you have a solution. But we'll definitely post it. Um, you know, like I said, it's it's common complaint, not a great answer, um, and that's kind of where we're stuck at this point. Um, any other questions? All right. Oh, so question being, uh, what's in the next version? Uh, I honestly have no idea. Um, so um, it's like. It's funny because I, I have a hard time keeping track of what what is the shipped version and what's the few, like because I usually know what's like two releases out and then I get confused about which version we're actually on, um, so I tend to just be like, eh. um, you know, because I'm I'm usually pushing the team to say, oh, but I really want to see you know blah blah blah, and they're like, we don't have enough people for that. I'm like, do it anyway. Uh, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I, I more I more provide input on what I think people would would like to see, um, and then sometimes I win and sometimes I don't. But I don't always keep track of whether I won or not. So um, uh, one other thing we were talking a little bit about life cycle before. Um, you know, a lot of the time, uh, you know, the life cycle for a Red House software collection is relatively short. Um, you know, compared to the rest of RHEL, uh, which is by design, right? We we're talking about the systems of differentiation, right? The idea is that they're being refreshed every, you know, three years or so, uh, and so as a result, they don't have to have a long-term life cycle. But uh, as with most things with software, uh, sometimes you're wrong when you chose kind of what class of application to put that in. Um, so a lot of the time, what we hope to have happen is that um, as the life cycle of a software collection is kind of getting EOL'd, um, that that same or nearby version is also showing up in, um, in kind of native RHEL. So while not a, not a complete, you know, just movement, um, it, it is hopefully a little bit, uh, not too bad to actually move it to the native version as long as you're willing to go to like kind of the latest version of RHEL. Um, so that's, that was generally the idea, you know, sometimes we're good at that, sometimes we're not as good at that um, to make that happen. All right, any other questions? All right. Oh, sorry, I, you're lost in the light for me. Oh, um, so I think I kind of glossed over the enable script, um, but let's see, it should be opt. Um, so when you do SCL enable, basically what it's doing is setting, uh, mo most of the time, it's setting a bunch of environment variables to convince your application that you run um, that all of the stuff is where it belongs. Um, so generally speaking, that's all it's doing. Some, some of them do a little bit more. Um, but that's what the enable script is. That's what he was referencing before, is that if you essentially just execute that script from within bash RC, um, you don't actually have to call SCL enable, S um, and it will um, kind of set up the same thing. Um, does that make sense? Any, other, any others? Cool. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, either these sides, I can't see at all, so. Yeah, pretty much. Um, there is a blog post on developer blog for that, uh, so I recommend reading that because me trying to transcribe it to you would be 
like hard to translate. Um, but yes, uh, there are articles on developer blog all about software collections. Uh, I know there's one because I wrote one about uh, enabling it from Bash RC. Uh, there are also a bunch around uh, how to do dependent collections um, and, and what's involved there. Um, so I highly recommend checking out developer blog, also checking out softwarecollections.org. Uh, and uh, both of those have a lot of content around kind of working with software collections. You know, so. All right, everybody, uh, I'm going to wrap it up because that's my time. But uh, thanks for coming, and uh, I'll see you next time.